Hello and welcome to another lecture of classical motion of a single particle. We have already discussed various properties of Euler Lagrange equations. We have in obtaining the equations of dynamics by using the method of Lagrangian, we have introduced the concept of generalized coordinates and generalized velocities. Okay. It somehow helps us to understand the system much more in a very uh, precise way. So, now I mean whenever I give you a system just by using your common sense, if you are trained now in finding the generalized coordinates or the generalized velocities, actually you will be able to find the minimum number of coordinates and velocities which are required to specify the motion of a particle under some given constraint. Okay. And of course, I said that all this business with Lagrangian, Euler Lagrange equations, they are not really limited within the realm of classical mechanics. Okay. The huge application of Lagrangian and Euler Lagrange equations may be found in the other domains like economics, like social science, like chemistry, like biology, even high energy physics and various other domains of complex science. Okay. Now, coming back to our today's discussion, today we will start a very interesting topic which I somehow already mentioned in some of the previous lectures that is the concept of phase space. Okay. And for that I will actually go back to our one of the very first lectures where I started talking about a dynamical theory and trying to see classical mechanics as a dynamical theory. So, if you remember, we said that a dynamical theory is consisting of two things, one is states. Okay. So, that means, they are the functions of space and time. Okay, which are well defined at every point of space and time. Okay. And then we say that there are the evolution equation of those states. Okay. Now, of course, when I say that states are the function of space and time, actually here I have somehow a tacit is the assumption of the evolution of natural systems and more like the physical systems. Okay. But of course, these states can be much more general. For example, for a system in economics, it can be a function of other intrinsic variables. Okay. Let us say sometimes money sometimes time okay, like this. Okay. Now, once again the second point is also very interesting that is the evolution equation of those states. Okay. So, for every state you have an evolution equation okay. and if I assume that my dynamical theory is actually consisting of a state variable psi, okay, then d psi dt okay, will be exactly equal to something, some function let us say phi which is a function of x and t okay, will be giving me the equation or evolution equation of the state phi. Okay. And that is once again here I am assuming that I am talking of the evolution of a natural or physical system. Okay. Now, in classical mechanics which is always already a special case of natural systems or natural dynamical theories, we have two states. One is the position and another is the velocity, but the classical mechanics has the principal objective of studying the motion of a particle. Okay. 
So, that is why whenever we talk about the position and velocity, they are also of the particle. Okay. Now, you see whenever you have this position, let us say I talk of the position vector r in three dimensions and you have velocity, I talk of r dot, then you can actually say, okay, I have actually six variables which are needed to describe the motion of a particle that is x, y, z and x dot, y dot, z dot. But now after this discussion of this Lagrangian, you know after discussing the concept of generalized coordinates, we now know okay, the minimum number of independent variables actually less than or equal to 6. Okay. Here there are 6 variables, so less than or equal to 6. Okay. So, and actually you see that if I just simply say that one coordinate is actually unnecessary, then of course, very simply the corresponding generalized velocity is also becoming unnecessary. So, in a sense, the number of independent variables for a normal physical system actually reduces by 2 okay, for from this whole number whole number of state variables. Okay. I am now going to just concentrate on the one dimensional motion of a particle. So, let us say for a particle the position is just x which is a function of t only here and x dot which is also a function of t. Okay. And here, so for classical mechanics once again, in one dimension. We have this is the set of state variables. So, the, the state variables. Okay. And the evolution equations are given by now. So, d d t of x is actually x dot itself okay. and d d t of x dot is equal to the force acting on the particle by the mass of the particle that we know that is the Newton's framework. Okay. Now, I can simply say that if instead of calling this x and x dot, I can simply call them as q and q dot, okay. then d q d t is equal to q dot and d q dot d t is equal to f by m. Okay. Now, the first relation looks very simple and it is actually very evident, okay. but to be very honest this is very characteristic of a classical mechanical system. If it is not a mechanical system actually d q d t can be anything which is not necessarily equal to q dot itself. Okay. So, what is the very uh, strange thing about or very special thing about classical mechanical system is that if you take the state variables of any motion, let us say for the simplest case in one dimension, any motion of one single particle in one dimension, okay, 
then the evolution equation of one variable is exactly equal to by construction you can say equal to the other variable. Okay. But the DDT of the second variable is not equal to the first variable, okay. this is something else that we cannot say immediately. Okay. We are not saying that dq dot dt is equal to something some q, okay. that is not true. Okay. Now, before going to do any other thing, I have just trying to say that here you see that this knowledge okay, basically somehow helps us now in understanding that although we can in principle write for any particles evolution or any dynamical system to represent the dynamical system we can write okay, for every possible coordinates and the evolution of this coordinates okay, and every possible velocity and the evolution of every possible velocity to write all the evolution equations of states actually it is customary to choose a system of generalized coordinates. Okay. And if you somehow choose the generalized coordinate, then you can say okay, I now know what are the minimum number of independent variables to describe the motion of a particle, let us say in 2D or 1D or 3D space. So, in 1D this is of course 1, but in 2D and 3D that depends on the nature of constraints, we do not know. Okay. In 1D that should be n is equal to 1. Okay. And of course, if it is 0, then it is a trivial static state and for 2D it can be n less than equal to 2 and for 3D it should be n less than equal to 3. Okay. Now, once you know the generalized coordinates, then you can actually know the generalized velocities and then you can actually say the simplest or the minimal form of the dynamical system is simply the set of q and q dots and their evolution equations. So, finally, you will have a set of two small n number of first order OD equations okay, where small n is the number of generalized coordinates for the system. Okay. So, now you can take just for instance for a particle moving in one dimension, I can simply say okay, I have only one generalized coordinate q which is a function of t and q dot. Okay. Okay. And for a particle moving in 2D, so in 1D, in 2D it should be q1, q2, q1 dot t and q2 dot Okay, in 2D. Okay. If you have one constraint, let us say now for simple pendulum, no one is going to prevent you from writing the whole equations of a simple pendulum in terms of x and y coordinates, for example, okay, which are not q1s and q2s. Okay. So, but for simple pendulum we know that we have actually one generalized coordinate theta and one generalized velocity theta dot. Okay. Then this will be my set of state variables and d theta dt is equal to theta dot and d theta dot dt is equal to something else which is the force will be giving me the total set of dynamical equations for the motion of a simple pendulum. Okay. Now, you see that here comes a very interesting point that whenever you are writing this, then always there is a tendency to represent the points okay, which are having coordinates as those set of state variables in a single plot. Okay. Now, let us say if I have 
a particle which is moving in one dimension, I actually have uh, an ensemble of state variables okay, with I mean consisting of two members q and q dot. If I have a particle moving with two degrees of freedom, not necessarily 2 d or 3 d, but two degrees of freedom, then we can actually have an ensemble with four members, four state variables q 1, q 2, q 1 dot and q 2 dot exactly like here. I represent. Okay. Now, in case of 3 D, you will have if you have no constraint, let us say you have 3 degrees of freedom, just a free particle or a particle which can move in 3 possible di dimensions, but it is acted upon by some force. Okay. It has 3 coordinates and 3 velocities, associated velocities. So, it has 6 state variables. Okay. So, whenever we define a space in which every point corresponds to the total collection of the state variables is called a phase space. So, phase space is a space where every point rep is represented by the collection of the total number of state variables. Okay. So, in general that is what I am saying, in general you see that mathematics wise you can always define phase space without even using the generalized coordinates, but that will give you sometimes redundant dimension for the phase space. So, you see that if one single point in the phase space should contain all the information of all the state variables for a given time for example here. then your phase space should actually have the dimension which is exactly equal to the number of the state variables. So, in 3D space for example, if there is no constraint, you know that the number of degrees of freedom is 3. So, you can actually construct a 6 dimensional phase space, but now let us say you know that your particle is moving in such a way that actually the number of generalized coordinates is 2. So, actually you should or it is actually I mean uh, how to say it is better to represent or mathematically it is much more it makes much more sense to represent them in a space with 4 dimensions. Otherwise, even if you use a 6 dimensional space then 2 dimensions will always be unused okay, or redundant okay. somehow using the symmetry and everything you know how to find the generalized coordinates for some usual systems okay, by using your common sense and the nature of constraints. Okay. And once you are done, then you can use those set of generalized coordinates along with the corresponding generalized velocities to define the resultant or the net phase space for that system. Okay. Now, I am just telling you, so let us say I have a, so in 3 D motion, okay. I actually have a 6 dimensional space, okay. 3 dimension I can show you here in this paper maximum and the other 3 dimensions are there which you cannot visualize, but you can simply imagine. Okay. And every single point then in that space will be given by an a collection of values of let us say q 1, q 2, q 3, q 1 dot, q 2 dot, q 3 dot at a given time instant t is equal to some t 1 let us say. Okay. Now, here for another point 
okay you have another set of values of these six variables okay but for another time instant t is equal to t2 okay now you remember for classical mechanics okay we are interested in seeing or in watching the evolution of motion of a particle so just remember of the telephonic conversation with your friend where you are and what you are doing so at every instant of time where the particle is situated and what is the velocity of the particle gives you the total state of motion okay of the particle of course and then if you now go to the phase space it will simply be giving you a single point so a single point in phase space so a single point in phase space is called a state okay for classical mechanics you can say state of motion for our case okay now if you do this actually you can see that so uh, once again a six dimensional phase space three dimensions you can see three dimension you cannot so do not think that they are drawn like this this is wrong this is just to tell you that there are okay six dimensions but they are not drawn like that you cannot draw this is a six dimensional space okay and this is the origin okay and you now starting from t is equal to 0 you start your watch and you trace the evolution of the particle okay and you find by joining those evolutions a trajectory and this is known as the phase space trajectory of the particle okay so a phase space trajectory simply gives you the vivid information of evolution that means how the mechanics of a particle changes and actually the kinematics x and x dot of the particle changes in course of time okay so if you have enough precise instrument for measuring things and if you have enough patience if you have enough efficient worker with you then actually you can measure almost at all the points the position and the corresponding velocity always position in the sense of generalized coordinates okay and velocity also in the same sense okay for that particle and thereby you can always construct the total evolution a map of the evolution okay so now the point is if i have one evolution trajectory like this can it just cut like this the answer is very simple no and yes you say are you crazy you say no you say yes okay so it's a very good point actually to understand so you see that i have two evolution equations for classical mechanics at least for classical mechanics i actually write one is ddt of x okay i am again writing x and y and z okay although you should now understand they are in terms of generalized coordinates okay x dot and of course same for y and z and then you have ddt of x dot which gives you some x component of force for example okay no problem with this if you have no explicit dependence of time in this x dot and f x okay so they change with time but intrinsically but they do not change explicitly with time the meaning is that when x dot is changing explicitly with time that means it is you can create a situation where x dot can be changed by changing time but keeping some other variables for example x double dot 
to be constant that is also possible. So, this is not possible here and that is why we say that if we construct a case where the velocity is of course, implicitly depending on t, but not explicitly and same for the force, then for such system such crossing is prohibited. Why? Because whenever you are going from this direction to this, okay, at this point you know that your future will be in this direction. But whenever you are going from this direction to this direction, you know your future will be at this direction. Okay. So, this point is nothing but a state of motion. In classical mechanics, our main assumption is that if we know the velocity and the position at some given time, we can undoubtedly or with 100 percent certainty, we can predict the position and velocity at a later time. If you stick to that, then basically you see at this point, you cannot determine uniquely where the particle will go and it is actually depending on where the particle is actually coming from and that is why this is in contrary to our assumption of classical mechanics, but this is not the whole story. If your system has an explicit dependence on some forcing, let us say some periodic forcing which is cos omega t, which we saw in case of a forced harmonic oscillator. Then this type of thing actually is not a very harmful thing, then you can say okay, then I actually can take time as another axis in the phase space. Okay just like an independent axis and let us say for a 3D system it will give you 6 plus 1 axis. Okay. So, although this particle will have the same state of motion like let us say x 1, x 2, x 3 and x 1 dot, x 2 dot, x 3 dot at some t 1 point, this particle will have the same coordinates and generalized velocities as well. For a t 2 point, you now see when you are representing the whole phase space taking t as an axis, then just depending on the different values of t, although the first 6 values are identical, since the t values are different, they will be represented by 2 different values. And that is why in such a system, if you now do not draw t explicitly, although you can see a crossing this crossing is not a harmful thing for your understanding of classical mechanics because these crossings are actually giving you two different points at two different times and here the rule of game changes with time explicitly, okay, the dynamics changes and that is why a crossing of phase space trajectory is permitted in this case. The first case where there is no explicit time dependence in the equations of the evolution of states, we call that as autonomous system. No explicit time dependence. Okay. If there is an explicit time dependence, we call that non autonomous system. Explicit time dependence. Okay. So, no crossing, okay, and here you have actually crossing possible. But, however, even in autonomous system where you do not have explicit time dependence, you can also have a case where there is a crossing possible and that is a trivial case actually. If you have trajectory which is like this but after doing this, the trajectory will always do like this. Okay. 
it will not go like this or like this, but it will always go like this. Or you can say, let us say the particle starts from some point and then the phase space trajectory is like this. Okay. So, crossing is only possible in an autonomous system. So, in an autonomous system, crossing of phase space trajectory, phase space trajectories is possible only for closed trajectories. Now, closed trajectories actually if you see if you have a closed trajectory in phase space that means, the system is regaining its position and the velocity okay, after some time in a repetitive way. My question to you to think I will explain it in a later lecture. Okay, does it essentially represent a periodic motion? a conservative system like that, okay. think and let me know. The final thing is that before wrapping this lecture is just this point that whenever you have in a phase space these two coordinates let us say x and x dot okay, or let us say 2 n coordinates I do not have any problem. Let us say q 1, q 2, q n and q 1 dot, q 2 dot, q n dot. Okay. You have this number of total state variables. Now, the point is that if there is a point in phase space let us say point P okay, for which all the corresponding evolution vanishes. That means, if I have a point P, I can find a point P here in the phase space for which. So, let us say I mean P can be given by with starred coordinates, let us say q 1 star, q 2 star, dot dot dot, q n star and then q 1 dot star, q 2 dot star q n dot star. Okay. So, you see that if this point is given by this, this ensemble of or collection of state variables, then if I have q 1 dot, q 2 dot, q n dot, q 1 dots dot that means, q 1 double dot, q 2 dots dot that is, q 2 double dot till q n dots dot okay, to be all equal to 0 okay, at p. Then, this p is known as fixed point of the motion. Okay. So, a fixed point is such a point in phase space at which for all the state variables have their DDT to be equal to 0. Okay. 
So, now if you can say that okay, just like uh, as we discussed last week that instead of calling q1 as coordinate or q1 dot as velocity, if I now say all of them are general some, some sort of more generalized coordinates, then I can actually define another ensemble or another collection of generalized corresponding velocities which are given by q1 dot q2 dot q3 dot dot dot, dot qn dot and q1 double dot q2 double dot up to qn double dot. Okay? So, at fixed point all this ensemble or all these collections of generalized velocities, I mean this more generalized velocities actually would always vanish identically. Okay? Now, what are fixed points and what are those properties? I will come back with this in the next lecture. Okay? Thank you very much.